Last month I made advent calendars for some of my family members and a dear friend who all live far away, based on an idea that we were using in one of my churches. Each calendar contains a package to be opened every day until Christmas, inside of which is an object, a Bible reading and a challenge or activity to complete. All of these 24 small packages were then wrapped in a gift bag and the gift bag was wrapped in a box with a big notice on it saying open on the 1st of December. And finally I wrapped these three boxes up in brown paper, addressed them and took them to the post office well in advance to make sure that they had arrived in plenty of time before they were needed. I think they all arrived about six days before the 1st of December which was good, but a few days later, I received a message from my sister who was feeling very impatient. She had put the parcel in her living room where she could see it and she knew she wasn't allowed to open it just yet, but the suspense was killing her. At about 6.30 in the morning on December the 1st, she sent me another message telling me that she'd opened parcel number one and had done the activity over breakfast. She obviously wanted to get started on opening the gift as soon as she possibly could. We begin Advent with a sense of watching and waiting. We start by acknowledging our need of a saviour. We're in a mess and there's no way that we can get out of it on our own. Then we move towards more hopeful anticipation. We realise that a new era is about to dawn. God is getting things ready. Something is going to happen. By the time we reach this point in the Advent season, we're invited to celebrate the gift of liberation that is ours in Jesus. The mood of expectation turns more and more into an expression of joy and celebration. It feels to me as though we've been holding on to the gift that we were given at the start of Advent and now we're beginning to unwrap that gift to see what's inside and more importantly to let that gift transform us. Each of the readings from the New Testament letters that have been set through Advent have something in common. They each anticipate the return of Jesus and they each link this very firmly to the demand to live faithfully and well in the waiting time. This chapter and the end of the previous chapter of Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians explicitly addresses the expectations surrounding the end times. Our reading for today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is a series of short imperatives to urge and encourage those Christians in living in Christ's way during this period of waiting. It's perhaps hard for us to understand the urgency with which these may have been written. After all, we've now been waiting for Jesus to return for a couple of thousand years, and perhaps in our own minds, we're not really expecting it to happen in our lifetimes. The early Christians really did expect it to happen sometime soon. In fact, a lot of stuff in the New Testament tries to address the fact that the first readers of the Gospels and the letters were living with this kind of delay. There's an immediacy about these directions too, and a directness. We're invited to imagine what life could be like if we all followed these things and put them into practice in our living. There aren't any ifs and buts, no get out clauses, no opportunities to opt out. These are essential and they're also given in quite general terms. Paul doesn't tell us exactly what is the good that we seek or what is the evil to avoid. We who read this are not let off the hook with regard to making ethical decisions. We take on the responsibility of discerning and determining what the will of God is in every aspect of our lives. The directions that make up our reading for today focus on three related things. Firstly, there is a specific call to a life of worship, which we read about in verses 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoicing and praying and being thankful are not just Sunday activities. In fact, whatever the day of the week it is, they're not just when we feel like it activities. Each has an emphasis on becoming normal and constant behaviour. Rejoice always, pray endlessly, give thanks all the time, no matter what is going on with you or around you. These are the signs of an existence oriented to God, where we who profess to believe in Jesus recognise that in every moment of our lives, in every decision that we have to make, 
God is a reality. We can't separate life into bits that are God related and bits that aren't. There are no bits of life that are not related to God. Spending money, voting in elections, making business decisions, relating to family members in the home, watching television or browsing the internet, all are ways in which God seeks to be glorified as well as in our private and public worship. The words Paul uses here in connection with our lives of worship are all great words as well. He doesn't talk about obeying or submitting to or serving, but he talks about joy and delight, gratitude and confidence. We may not be inclined to give thanks for all the circumstances of our lives, but Paul can't imagine any situation in which we would be unable to recognise any signs of God's love and grace and give thanks. And this seems particularly poignant when we remember that the original readers of this letter had faced considerable persecution. Secondly, there is a specific call to a life of discernment, which we read about in verses 19 to 22. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from what is evil. There are some parts of the Christian experience that are ambiguous or challenging or even just awful. And we're called to discern God's activity here. The Spirit is the divine activity in human life over which we have absolutely no control whatsoever. Now as believers we can deny the presence of the Spirit and we can fail to notice the prompting of the Spirit or we can join in with whatever the Spirit is doing. But we can't manipulate the Spirit. We can't make the Spirit do anything that we want it to do. So Paul urges us not to quench the Spirit. It's because the Spirit's activity is mysterious and often ambiguous that we're challenged to be discerning. We're challenged not just to test and discern God's will, but to test and discern everything. All of our human experience needs to be examined and interrogated in order to determine what is the good we're to hold on to and what is the evil we need to avoid. This means looking at the things we do, the events we're involved with, the practices and habits of our private lives, the relationships we have, and determining in each case what is the good we are to embrace and the evil we are to shun. And prophets are to be listened to, but the same rules of discernment must apply. Not all prophets are disclosing messages from God, and like everything else in our lives, they need to be tested. Thirdly, there is a specific call to a life of holiness, which we read about in verses 23 to 24. May the God of peace sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The verb sanctify, which just means to make holy, might horrify us if we've had any experience of the kind of legalistic brands of religion that organise life around a long list of do's and don'ts. We might say that we want to have nothing to do with that kind of moralism and meritocracy. Instead, we're called to stand apart, to stand apart from the traditional power structures that seek to divide and marginalise and hate, that are self-serving, enhancing the interests of certain parties at the expense of others, that fail to recognise the dignity of every person and treat some as less deserving than others and even some as less than human that tell us if we just work hard enough and do more, then we can save ourselves. The call to a life of holiness is not through a list of do's and don'ts, but rather holiness comes to us through prayer. Only God can make us holy. We can't do it ourselves. Only God can keep our whole selves sound and make us blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, holiness is a gift of God and not an act of human will, and it develops through a life of prayer and worship, through living with eyes fixed on Jesus, recognising that every part of our lives has to do with God, and through discerning where God is at work in us, in others, and in the world around us. These are the gifts that we are invited to unwrap today, these are some of the gifts we may find when we receive and accept and open and embrace in our lives the gift of Jesus. 
lives turned to God and filled with worship at all times in all circumstances, discerning lives that seek to be open to the activity of the Spirit, holy lives that are transformed by the deepening of our relationship with Christ through prayer and able to see things more and more through his eyes, all of these things can be ours. So as we continue to unwrap our Advent gifts, may we embrace the Spirit's work in us and accept the invitation to be challenged and transformed. Amen. <laughs>